Welcome to my vintage love. I'm here today with a 30s makeup tutorial that I'm so excited to share with you. My friend Sarah is here to help me out. She has a beautiful 30s look, so let's get started. Here we are with Sarah and her face is beautiful and clean and ready to go. Um, the 30s was a really exciting time for makeup. It became much more acceptable to wear by women of all classes and it became much more refined. The 20s was this explosion of creativity and this explosion of, you know, just try anything and the result could kind of, you know, be hit or miss. The 30s was much more about the refining of makeup and how to wear it. And you saw much more written about makeup in magazines. But in the 20s, it was, you barely see any mention of it or it was hidden in the back ads. But by the late 20s, early 30s, there were beauty columns being written about how to wear makeup, the best techniques to put it on and apply it and the best colors to wear, and books were written about it, so it was a very exciting time for makeup. Um, and people were also very influenced by movie stars. This was the golden age of Hollywood. People were looking to escape the depression and the, the everyday doldrums of life. And they, you know, the, the Hollywood movie stars were the pinnacle of beauty, and as well as the first time that Hollywood movie stars and socialites were used in in advertising. So you see that a lot in the magazines of the day, ladies so-and-so advertising a soap or a cream or a powder. Um, and I thought what was interesting too was that it became more acceptable for socialites to wear makeup because they realized how important makeup was to look good in photographs. They saw themselves being in photographs in the paper and magazines. They were photographed at at events that they would go to, big parties and polo events and things like that, and they realized that they didn't look so good without makeup on, so it became more acceptable to them to wear makeup so they could look good in all those paparazzi photos. Um, so we're gonna get started on the makeup. I am going to use pancake makeup. This was invented by Vax Factor in 1937 and sold to the general public in 1938, and it was the most popular makeup product at the time. Um, before that, Women were really just using powder for their complexions. I did see references to liquid foundations and liquid creams, but I didn't see it talked about being talked about much. It was a lot of powder being used at the time. So the liquid creams and foundations were around, but I think the vast majority of women would have just been using powder. But pancake makeup really, really changed all that. Um, it was invented by Max Factors to be totally flat on camera. So it's very flat, it's very matte, um, it does have a beautiful finish. There is a kind of a learning curve to using it. I did an entire video just about pancake makeup. There's gonna be a link to that in the description below. So if you want a more in-depth discussion about pancake makeup and a more in-depth discussion about how to apply it, please watch that video. I'm just kind of gonna be racing through um, this application now. Pancake makeup is one of those things that there's lots of steps to it and there's a bit of a learning curve, but once you do, it creates this really beautiful finish. Uh, today, I'm gonna to be using the Ben Nye Color Cake Makeup in these two colors. Pancake makeup is kind of tricky to match the color in because it looks much different in the pan than it does on the skin. Um, it also looks different when it's wet versus when it's dry and also after it's buffed out. So it's, it's kind of a tricky thing to learn how to match. So I'm gonna be using a sea sponge. I'm getting it wet. And this is one of the things <clears throat> about pancake makeup that can be tricky is you want to be sure to get the consistency right. You don't want it too thin or too thick. Um, it's just one of those, one of the parts that's interesting to learn. Makes you appreciate the wonder of modern, uh, modern day foundation <laughs> even more when you start using pancake makeup. Oh, it was more challenging back then for sure. But I can imagine it was quite a revelation at the time when there probably weren't that many, um, there weren't as many found, uh, like I said, there weren't that many foundation options on the market at the time. So when Max Factor came out with this, I expect it was quite, you know, quite a revelation. So this is going to look, it looks kind of funky on the skin when you first get it on the skin. We're just going to be dabbing it on. I'm just going to keep it pretty wet. And there was no concealer as such in the day. So if there is a type, is there, if there's a part of the skin that you want a little more coverage on, you're just gonna give a little more attention to that area. How does this feel, Sarah? Good. Good. <laughs> Sarah loves to have her face touched, so she's an ideal model for today. Sarah's features are amazing for the 30s aesthetic because she has kind of 
rosebud lips and nice thin brows, which we'll talk about later, and this gorgeous profile. So I'm very happy that she could model for us today. It's always a little bit easier when you're using a model that has features that are good for that era. And really the two most important features between the 20s and 30s, the most distinctive features between the 20s and 30s is the, the lip shape and the brow shape. Because of course when we think of the 20s, we think of those low flapper brows, and in the 30s it's the high, high arched brows. So you can see this is looking, it looks a little weird, like I said. You definitely would not, you would not leave things here. <laughs> You can definitely cut a smaller sponge if you need to. It would be good to get into the nooks and crannies. So this is a little bit yellow on her skin. We're going to even that out a little bit with the powder, but um, that's just kind of the nature of the beast of this particular product. Do I look tan? You look, <laughs> you look yellow right now. Nice. <laughs> like a jaundice look. A wee bit, yes. So this really is the product that gave the stars that just super smooth, beautiful look. Like when you're looking at those George Harrell glamour portraits and all of those movie stills and things like that, that's, that's how they looked so smooth and beautiful. So we're just gonna wait for that to dry. <laughs> <laughs> Let me know when it feels like it's like really virtually okay. almost dry, yeah. It's kind of counterintuitive because you think you still want it to be a little wet, but you actually want it to be super dry, quite dry, like 95% dry, I'd say. Does it dry lighter than the yellow, or does it? Um, like it you does see it change color. Not, not. It starts to change color once you start to buff it in, right? And then once you put the powder on too, that will give it a little bit more of um, cool. whatever kind of color shift you want it to go towards. So I actually have a very um, pink powder. Um, from this is a uh, Tila Cleric powder. And um, I'm probably going to use this because this is pulling very yellow on her skin and I want to give her a little more pink. And also pink was a very popular powder color in the 30s. I saw a lot of references to, you know, ivory pink toned powder. Um, so that was kind of the, the color certain ladies wanted to be back then. It's funny, like that's the same color as my skin. <laughs> oh, this pink one? powder? Yeah. <laughs> You're very pink. pink. Yes. When I was buying um, these colors at Alcone, they... Um, I was like, oh, I need a pinker one, I need a pinker one, and they were like, Ben Nye, the, this particular brand that just mm -hmm. runs yellow, and I think these, um, I think the pancakes tend to run quite yellow as well. So I do not know product. if that would have been the case back in the day, but um, I think it's just modern. the product, the modern product, yeah. I mean, I think back in the day, honestly, cosmetics tended to run very, very pink for the most part. Um, for whatever reason, I'm sure it was something to do with what was available in terms of cosmetics. Um, but yeah, um, up until the 90s, I'd say, things just ran pink. I think we think of like... No, I remember. Yeah. Like, like I remember that yes. Max Factor. Like, you yeah. open it up and that smell yes. would hit yeah. you and yeah. it's all just pink tones. Yeah, yeah, it was yellow. all pink ones. Yeah, super yellow or, or super, super pink. pink. Yeah. In the middle. It was actually Bobby Brown, I think, who was one of the first um, brands to have, like, a lot of yellow in the foundations, which was really great. Um, but yeah, I remember, like, you'd go to, like, the drugstore and you'd see, you know, like, drugstore brands and it would be, like, Pepto-Bismol pink. You're like, who is this? Who is this color for? Like, who was who was who was this pink? Some people are. I mean, there are there are people like I run quite pink and you yeah. run quite pink, but for the most part, people are not that pink. <laughs> are you feeling pretty pretty dry? Almost. Okay. Side. A little. Yeah, I think I got a little heavier on the sides, so. And around the eyes, still a little wet. Yeah. Okay, it's pretty dry. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna go in. Okay. Okay. So we're gonna start buffing this out. So I'm buffing this out with a firmly densely packed larger brush. And we're just going to buff and buff and buff. Buffing the skin with pancake is a bit like brushing your hair out after a set. You have to kind of keep going longer than you think you need to. <laughs> so this is the first, this is, I guess, the second step, but the first step in buffing. Is this like the height of your day right here? Like someone just buffing yeah, your face? Yeah, no, it's the best. <laughs> Really, this is like the most luxurious thing that's happened to me all week. <laughs> and you called and said, can I do your makeup? I was like, yeah. <laughs> Are you going to be touching my face for an hour? <laughs> Perfect. So you can see I'm still buffing. It's, it's really, it's a process. 
but you can see it's, it's smoothing out. It looks a lot better than it did when I first got it on there. It's definitely one of those things you just, you gotta hang with it. So I'm pretty happy with the way the, the brush buffing is, and I'm gonna move on to the next step, which is to take a clean powder puff and buff it in just a little bit more. So clean powder puff and just keep buffing. And I mentioned this before, but really, this is a very, very flat matte product. If you want a product, if you want something to give you shine, this is not that product. You really just need to keep that in mind. You can add shimmer on top of it, you could add anything you want on top of it, but to get the, it was made with the intention of being flat to, to stay on camera for many hours at a time. Look up for me. So just keep that in mind. Um, I mean, like, as with anything, it's always good to think about, like, what was it created for? Why was it made? If something's made to be matte, you're not going to get it to be shiny. So now, the next step is to take a powder puff and load it up with powder. And I'm going to use the T. Leclerc. This is T. Leclerc Lilium. This is quite a pink powder, as you can see. You can really use any type of powder that you want, any kind of loose powder, um, translucent. I'm gonna go ahead and use this pink one because as we were saying, um, the, the pancake is quite yellow and Sarah's a little more pink, so I just wanna add a little more pink back into that um, and give her a little more, a little more life. So I'm really loading up that puff. Got a lot of powder on there. And just, it's nice and loaded up. And I'm just going in there and I'm gonna buff some more. This is a good time to just look at the skin and think like, you know, okay, what, which way do I want this color to go? Is it too yellow? Is it too pale? Is it too dark? Is it too pink? And then if you have colored powder to really, you know, pull it one way or the other. Ideally, you should be matching the skin tone, um, but as I said, it is tricky to match the pancake, so this gives you a chance to fix that a little bit. So that's the um, final look of the pancake makeup. As you can see, it's, it is a bit of a process, um, but I really, it really looks beautiful when it's done. Um, so it is, it, is worth, it is worth the effort if you decide to do that. Um, you can very easily recreate a 30s look without the pancake makeup. I just wanted to do this to show what it looks like. So let's move on. Okay, so we're gonna move on to the brows next. Um, the brows are by far one of the most iconic parts of a 30s makeup. I think when we think 30s makeup and a 30s brow, we all think Jean Harlow, Amarlene Dietrich, and Claudette Colbert with those beautiful high arched brows. Um, that was definitely a thing. The brows were very high and they were very arched in the 30s, um, but not everyone had was doing the full pluck and draw in just so we know like I was looking through a lot of the classic um, the classic Hollywood portraits of the time and plenty of women had brows actually really similar to Sarah's that were plucked and thin and high but not a full shave not the full pluck not the full draw on so this is actually a perfect brow to work on um, thank you so much Sarah <laughs> um, <laughs> the other thing that's interesting to note at the time is that um, there really didn't have separate brow and separate eyeliner pencils, they were basically the same thing. Um, so you could use brown, black, and I actually saw a reference to using a blue eyeliner, Cute. or blue uh, brow pencil on very <laughs> dark hair. Um, so if you were like very dark brown or black hair, you could go ahead and use like a dark blue, which I thought was pretty darn fascinating. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't think, think, you know, you could totally do that if you watch. I just think it's a really interesting thing to note. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and just use a good old coffee pencil by MAC. Um, 
And because they didn't have as many color options for brows, blondes were really like, they, they had a darker brow back then. You look at those, even like Jean Harlow with her you know, very, very white blonde hair, she had dark brows that were drawn on. Marlena Dietrich, Marlena Dietrich same thing. And so it didn't really matter if you were a blonde, you weren't using a taupe that we would use now. Um, you were just going for it and using a brown pencil. Um, so I'm just gonna go in there and do that. Nice. I really do want it to be higher, so I'm going to go ahead and draw along the high part of the brow. I'm following Sarah's natural brow line. I just want to, I'm just keeping it as high as I can on the top of her natural brow line and keeping the line very thin. And they also like to extend the brow a bit, so I'm just gonna go ahead and like make that brow a little bit longer. That's the one thing about the Therese brow I think is, we think it's this very codified brow. We think it was Jean Harlow, we think it was Marilyn Dager. It really wasn't. I mean, there was a lot of different brow shapes going on in the 30s, so really keep it high, keep it thin, but other than that, like have fun with it. Um, Sarah's brows really are a great, perfect 30s brow, because they give, it's a nice, she has a nice like, template of where to go, but then there's so much flexibility within her shape. I say this a lot when teaching makeup, is that you should always go to the original sources. So you can find a lot of things online that say what 30s makeup was, but the best thing you can possibly do to learn more about it is to go look at the Hollywood glamour portraits of the day, go look at what people were actually wearing, go look at the ads of the day. That's really what's going to tell you what was happening back then, um, because anything anyone tells you is just distilled into what they're seeing. So I got, I learned so much just looking at pictures and magazines. And that's actually the biggest difference if you're trying to differentiate between a 20s brow and a 30s brow. A 20s brow is very, very low. A 20s brow they would put them in around here. Um, but the 30s brow is when things started to get really high and really arched. Another really fun thing to do is to look at, um, to look at starlets when they arrived in Hollywood in the 20s or even the teens and then see like what Hollywood, how Hollywood made them over. Like Greta Garbo is a great example. You know, she came in there with her not so great teeth and you know, was, you know Pigtail. pigtails, you know, and the not great, uh, you know, not great hair and they just, man, they just totally did her over. It's really interesting to see. So we have our 30s brow on one side and we're gonna go ahead and do the other side. But you can see it's just this nice, gorgeous arch. Also, my eyebrows are deceptive. I'm like a Picasso. Are you? So you might have to like <laughs> okay. overdraw one. <laughs> Brows are, brows are cousins, not twins. That's one of my favorite things I ever heard about brows. So if they're, they're a little different. <laughs> really? Yeah, they're not no. even related. <laughs> oh, I think they look great. Okay. I think there's something kind of fun about the 30s Hollywood, and it was they really kind of leaned into the artifice of, the artifice of it all, which I, you know, and the escapism that Hollywood offered. I think that's really, I really like that. We all need a little escapism, I think. Agreed. Right? Saying this in Especially 2020. COVID. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Saying this in, in 2020. <laughs> if you want to do a 30s look and you don't have thin brows, no. if you don't want to tweeze them and you don't want to shave them, you can do the mm -hmm. drag queen glue cover trick, uh, which is covering with glue and then foundation. There's plenty of... Um, Places online, you can find out where to do that. Or if they're on the blonder side, you can run um, some foundation and concealer through them. Foundation is how I had mine usually. Yeah, and then draw over that with a darker pencil. Um, so if you have dark, thick brows, you'll probably want to do the, the brow cover if you want to do a true, true 30s situation. Because that really is the key to the, the 30s look in my mind is the it's the brow and it's the lip and also the color placement too for the um, for the blush. Yeah, I like finding pictures of uh, regular people mm -hmm. from the '30s yeah. and seeing their interpretation yes. of what they were seeing in magazines. Oh yeah, I love that too. It's so funny and great. It yeah, just very I, sweet. I, yes, <laughs> I, I love it. Yeah, I love I love that that dichotomy between this is what the 
the movies were doing and this is what the general public was doing. This is their, this was their interpretation of it. I think it's super fascinating. Yeah, I love we see that now. Oh, you see it I love with it. Instagram yeah. girls. Yeah, great. exactly. Yeah, cuz not everyone I mentioned this in the my 20s video like not everyone was they want you to believe that everyone was doing everything the same way all the time and that's not the way it is. And you know, there were definitely the girls that were doing trying to emulate the stars. You just see like circle bras like a circle like they bras? took a cup and drew a line. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, they do the Yep, exactly. Which I love. Yes, I love it too. I mean, yeah, can you imagine the number of girls that saw pictures of Jean Harlow and, wow. and Marlon, and Marlon and Jericho were like, I want that, and they just plucked them all out and drew them on. <laughs> and then in the 40s, when a more natural brow came out, it was just like, oh, shit. <laughs> what did I do? Yeah, they never grew back. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes they do. Sometimes they don't. Um, but yeah, you can definitely see in pictures, too, of, um, of you know, stars, if you, some of the stars that were around for decades. Yeah. You see them with the, like, the 20s and 30s when it was really thin, and then you get to the 40s and like some of them, sometimes the stars' brows get thick again and sometimes they don't. So the brows are on. So we're gonna move on to the eyes. This was a time, the 30s was when color really got popular. In, tw in the 20s, they were really limited in colors. It was like, for eyeshadow, it was like black, brown, a little bit of blue, a little bit of green, and it wasn't worn that much, but in the 30s, it was you had a lot more color options in terms of what was available and what you could use. I think, to be honest, I think most women probably just would have been using like a gray or a brown shadow, um, but because we're here, we're gonna do a colored shadow, which I really, really think will be really fun. Um, I think color was something that was really exciting in the 30s, and people were really playing around more with that because, because of its accessibility, honestly. In one of the books that I used to do research, it was all about match the color of your eyeshadow to the color of your eyes, and if you're a brunette, you use this, and if you're a blonde, you use that. Very specific. Uh, I think that was something else really big in the 30s was all about these rules that they, that was set by the magazines and fashion and everything about what you should be using for what. So Sarah has beautiful green eyes, so I'm gonna go ahead and use a green eyeshadow, which will be really fun. I think there were some iridescent shadows that were available, but I think for the most part they were using matte shadows back then. This is the um, Fizzy Art. Whoop. That was the Fizzy Art. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Snap. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Just kidding. I know. Um, <laughs> that was very cute. That was, that was very cute. Um, so, um, back in the day, they. They had iridescent shadows. I've, saw, I've seen mention of iridescent shadows, but I think for the most part, it would have been matte shadows. So I'm gonna go ahead and use the green shades on Sarah. This is a great series of palettes by Viseart. This is, this is the third one, so this is all like the brights. Um, the second one is a lot of beautiful, um, shiny, sat, um, shiny, shimmery ones. And then the first one is an amazing neutral one, but this, is, this one is just like great just for it's really saturated. It's it yeah, it's got it all. <laughs> Honestly, if you have this one and the first one, that's all you need. So I'm gonna go ahead and use this lovely color of green. They don't have the names or numbers listed on there, so I can't give it to you, I'm sorry. So I'm just laying this down with a little brush. Virtually all of the tutorials that I read were said to apply your eyeshadow with your finger, but I really wanna make this a little more professional. So I'm gonna go ahead and use a brush. Something else that was really popular to do back then was to apply Vaseline to the lids and the brows to give shine. But since we're doing, since we're doing this, since we're doing color, I think color and shine might be a bit much, so I'm just gonna do the color right now. But if you're doing a 30s look, I think you could definitely do a brow, do a lip, do, do the blush, and then do a tiny bit of liner and do some Vaseline on top of that, and it would be really great. That being said, Vaseline moves a lot, and it gets very Greasy. Very greasy, very quickly. <laughs> so um, it's not a long-term thing. I 
see that written about a lot, like, put Vaseline on your lid. And I'm like, oh my god, that's so messy. But it looks good on camera. It does. It looks amazing on camera. Yeah, if you're doing a photo shoot, yeah, freaking go for it. Moving. Yeah, then you're just going to be standing on set looking glamorous. One of the books that I was doing this research, using, doing the research for this video, is um, a reprint of a book called Just Makeup by Virginia Valverde from 1932, which was very, very useful for all of this. And the amount of color that she called for in this book was really, really fascinating. So I'm using some of the techniques I saw in that book for this. If you're wondering where on earth these ideas are coming from. I'm using a Smith 247 brush to blend it out. It's always good just to lay down the color first. This is a Smith 253. It's always good just to lay down the color where you want it and then blend it out. So that's what I'm doing here. And go ahead and look up for me. I'm gonna put a tiny bit underneath the eye along the lower lash line. Nothing too crazy, just a tiny bit of color. When I'm applying makeup, when I'm applying eyeshadow, I am applying, saturating the brush with color and then I'm tapping it off. Sometimes I use a table, sometimes I use my hand, but it's a really good thing to, really good idea to do that, especially if you're using bright colors or dark colors. Okay. So we've got those nice brows already and we got the color happening there, so I think it looks really cool. So I'm going to go ahead and do the other eye. I think this is always worth mentioning is that there was color back then. I know we're putting colored eyeshadow on Sarah right now, but because everything, so much of the media, almost all the media back then was in black and white, I think we do tend to forget that color was happening. Things were in color. This is a dress from the 30s. This, she's wearing a dress from the 30s. Clothing was in color. Cosmetics were in color. Not everyone was walking around in black and white. So while I don't think that the vast majority of women were probably rocking full colored eyeshadow every day, it was there, it was around, you could use it. As I mentioned before, eyeliners and eyebrow pencils were basically the same thing. So you basically had black, blue, or brown for eyeliner options and eyebrow options. I'm gonna go ahead and use a little bit of liner on the top. It wasn't meant to be like a strong, strong liner like that you got into in the 40s and 50s. This is more just to create like a little depth of the lash line. This is again the MAC coffee pencil, good basic. So just getting that right into the base of the lashes. Again, we just want this to serve as a, a lash thickener, if you will. I just like to lift the eyelid up a bit to really get it in the root of the lash. And I'm using a little pencil brush this is a pencil brush from Hakahoto. Anything with this shape is great just to buff that out just a little bit. Because again, it's not a hard line. It's just to get that soft open. So you can see that just gives a little more weight to the lash line, which I think is always a good idea if you're doing a color around the eye or anytime really. I'm close for me. I personally like a liner in this style, kind of no matter what makeup I'm doing. When I do makeup on clients, I like to be able to hold up the lid a little bit to get more access to the lash line. It just, it's just a habit I picked up. It's, it's better to use the little pads because it allows you to not actually touch the face, which most people, which helps you not disturb the makeup that's already on the face. Sarah has on her brows, eyeshadow, and liner, and now we're gonna do the mascara. And we are going to be using cake mascara because that's what they used back then. Something really interesting I found out when I was researching was that there was 
but there was colored mascara back then. It was in black and brown, but also blue, green, and purple. And I saw quite a few references to using it in your makeup. So I think it is something that would have been used by by women every day um, or for special occasions. So I thought that was really interesting. Actually, I had not realized that colored mascara was a thing back then. But right. just to find out that that was like happening at all was like, that's oh. exciting. Wow, that's cool. Um, so that was really interesting, I thought. Um, so the, the cake mascara is another thing with a bit of a learning curve. Um, so you want to, it was called spit cake. So it would actually, people would spit in it to activate mm. it. Um, so you want to think about that when you're using, don't do that first of all. <laughs> um, and second of all, you're, you're going to activate it with water. So you don't need a lot of water. I think what happens, a lot of people like just like go crazy with the water and it's like, oh, it's too thin, but it's actually, it's not. You just need to use the right amount of water. Sorry. And actually, before we get to the mascara, I am going to curl Sarah's lashes. They did have eyelash curlers in the 30s, and they, the design of a lash curler actually hasn't changed that much. It is still, it was pretty similar to this back in the day, and this is a Troy Surratt curler. Um, but yeah, I mean, lash curlers, the, the general design hasn't changed that much since the beginning. It really does help to raise, to lift up the lash a little, raise up the whole eye, the look of it, so. I do, do, do recommend using a lash curler if you can. If I'm, if I'm having a no makeup day for myself, if I can at least curl my lashes and brush my eyebrows up, I feel like I can leave the house. <laughs> <laughs> That's my line in the sand. Cake mascara, little bottle of water. You can do three pumps of water, so not much. And then it comes with this little brush. Looks very similar to a toothbrush. You can also use a spoolie, which is totally fine and works well. Because we're trying to keep this authentic, I am gonna be using this brush. Go ahead and look up. I'm gonna go ahead and do the lower lashes first. Look a little bit. They really liked bottom mascara back then. I saw a lot of pictures with a lot of bottom mascara. This is actually applying really well. I'm really happy. I think doing doing these videos too and doing the research and actually, you know, applying it as close to as close as I can to what they would have been doing back then. It really makes me appreciate the makeup that we have now, to be honest, because things were just it was just more challenging back then. You know, this brush is not ideal to be applying mascara with. So man, I really appreciate my regular mascara when I have it now, let me tell you. <laughs> yeah, there's not a lot of room for error. There's not a lot of room for error. And with the pancake makeup too, like once it's on, it's on. You really can't move around. Um, yeah, a lot less, lot less room for error. We have a lot more, a lot more grace nowadays. Makes you appreciate all the, all the modern ingredients and the silicones and the the things we take for granted now. <laughs> I love watching the step-by-step -step as things become, they just look better and better, I think, kind of like, it looks kind of crazy with, you know, just the foundation on or just the brows on, but then like once you start getting everything else on, it's like, oh, now it's looking it's good. Along. I love it, coming along. One of the first classes I ever took actually as a makeup artist was at MAC and it was a, it was a drag makeup class. And I'll never forget the teacher saying like, the crazier the makeup is, the longer, the longer you think you're in the woods and the longer you're like, oh crap, what am I doing? Right. But then it all starts to come together and you're like, oh, okay, it's fine. Look down for me. So every time I do a, a, a stronger makeup or a more editorial, crazier makeup, I always, I always remember that. Because there's a good, anywhere between a minute to 20 minutes where I'm like, oh God, what have I done? So this is a mascara shield. I actually, in my research, I just saw a picture of something that was very similar to this. So what this does is this just allows you or the makeup artist to hold up the, the lid and lets you get to the lash without getting mascara all over the lid, which is really convenient, especially when you're using a brush like this. So you're, it's basically kind of like a backstop to, to put against the the lid so you can paint the lashes without worrying about the mascara getting on the lid. It kind of, you just gently apply it and it kind of lifts up the lid. 
This is kind of something that's a little more what a makeup artist would have, um, but you can certainly use it on yourself if you're fairly coordinated. That's really neat. I'm getting one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Look down. It's just one of those little tools that can make life a little bit easier. I was very surprised when I saw the picture for something that looks kind of similar, but I can definitely imagine this, very easily imagine this in a, something similar to it in a, a Hollywood makeup room. Because they, the love affair with makeup, with, I'm sorry, with mascara really started in the 20s and they it definitely continued on to the 30s. It was very, you definitely, I definitely saw quite a few pictures of stars with a lot of mascara on, a lot. <laughs> I think once women kind of understood what a difference mascara makes in their eyes, they were like, I want more of that. I look awake. Yes. That's the other thing I love. The other type of makeup that I personally like need to have <laughs> on my face before I leave. So we have our mascara on and I'm going to apply false lashes now. False lashes were definitely around and definitely very popular in the 30s. You see almost every portrait of a, a Hollywood star with with mascara on. Um, the thing about the lashes in the the thing about false lashes in the 30s was that they were very long and thin. So it wasn't a thickening lash; it was a long, thin lash. So I found these from Red Cherry Eyelashes. These are the Kennedys, and I really like the way that these look uh, for a nice 30s look. So long, thin, not thickening. So I'm just gonna make sure that these are the right width for Sarah's lashes, or eyes, I should say. So what I was doing right there is I was just making sure that these were the right width for Sarah's eye. That's a really important thing to do if you're using strip lashes because you don't want it to be too long in either direction. So if it is, if it is too wide, you wanna um, trim off from the end of it but these seem to be the right width for your lashes, so I'm just gonna go ahead and apply glue. If a false lash is poking you at all, you really need to trim it down. They can be comfortable. Um, they don't have to be agony, but if you feel any discomfort when you first get them on, take them off and, and try to reapply. And make sure that they're sitting the way that they should. So I'm just using um, latex-free duo lash glue. I really do like this kind because it has a little tiny brush and it makes applying the glue very easy so you don't get too much. So um, just look down. A good trick for applying lashes is to look down but don't close your eyes because when you close your eyes, your, your lid will wrinkle a little bit and you want a nice flat surface. Does that feel okay? Mm -hmm. okay. I know you're used to having lashes on, so. <laughs> Open it. Oh, beautiful. Yeah, that's a great lash right there. Mm -hmm. I feel like I can see Gorgeous. again. Gorgeous. <laughs> you can see again. I can see again. <laughs> My eyes are on. <laughs> right? <laughs> when you get those lashes on, you're like, oh. oh I can see. <laughs> if you find lash glue tricky to get on using the squeezy bottle kind, this latex-free kind with the little brush is really great. It allows you to not get too much glue on which I've, I've heard from clients is a big issue when they're applying lashes is they say they have too, too much glue goes on. Great way around that. Okay. Ah. These are so you, like, because I, I know Sarah pretty well. Like, you're, you got these lashes on, it's like, oh, there's Sarah. <laughs> I'm here. I made it. There she is. I'm going to put a little more mascara on the bottom just because I want to pop that bottom mascara a wee bit because it looks so cool. Okay. And I could very easily make this a much more subtle 30s makeup. I could use different colors, make it a little more natural, but I really just wanted to go for it and have fun with the color and kind of do the more extreme end of 30s. So don't feel like you have to do, it doesn't have to look like this if you want to do a 30s makeup. Is very much just about having fun. So the next thing is blush. And blush is really interesting in the 30s. I think the placement is really fascinating because it was very high. It was a very, very 
high placement to the blush. In the 20s, it was more like the little circle here in the middle of the cheekbone, but back then, it was like right here. Um, you see this over and over again in the, the 1932 makeup book that I was using to research in almost all of the advertisements. The vast majority of the time, the blush is super, super high. I know, I really like it when it's just like, dude, dude, yeah. <laughs> so Hello. I think that's, I think it's super fascinating. It's, it's such a pretty look too. I think it's a gorgeous look on the face. And I think, I, let's bring that back. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm just gonna go ahead and use Let's see, I'm gonna see which looks better. This is the Great Convertible Color by, by Stila. Oops, sorry. Convertible Color by Stila. Still around. I don't actually know if they make these two colors. I'm gonna be using Poppy and Fuchsia. I don't actually know if they still make these two colors, but I know they have lots of other colors I that they still these. make. Aren't these gorgeous? Yeah, classic product. I scraped this out to put it in a palette, um, but you know, beautiful, gorgeous, bright colors. And that's another thing, like I said before, like they really liked bright colors, especially for their blush in the 30s. Like they were not afraid of that, um, at least in the ads and things like that. I, again, I don't know if it would have been something that would have been used super bright every day by everyday women, but it, all those ads, I cannot stress this enough. It's like the amount of blush that they had on was just like, oh my gosh. Um, so don't be afraid to kind of like lean into that. So Never afraid of blush. Yeah. <laughs> we like blush. We like blush a lot. I think we've definitely kind of gone towards so so much bronzer in our life, you know, in the U.S. especially, or like yeah. all over, really. And it's like I think a lot of people have kind of forgotten like how beautiful um, blush can be and how like how it just makes it look younger and prettier. So I'm just putting, I'm taking cream blush and combining the two colors onto my hand. And then I'm just going right underneath Sarah's eye. So I just want to get the color on there and I'm going to take a brush and blend that out. So again, super high, high placement. They would kind of take it out a little bit. They wouldn't do a full wrap, but they would definitely just blend it out. Another one of the techniques that I saw mentioned was how to make, how to apply blush to an older face, which I, which, you know, back then meant over 35. Um, but um, <laughs> they talked about putting the blush like literally like just in this area here, like right in the, underneath the eye. We're not gonna do that. I wonder right. what the thought behind that I was. I thought, I think the, the thought was to bring like just color to this area because, you know, we tend you to get saw, yeah, sunken. You the, the yeah, you, yeah, exactly. So I'll, I'll show you this book. It's, yeah, a, it's it. fascinating. And again, because it was written in 1932, it, it makes me so much more comfortable saying like, oh, that's actually what they might've been doing back then. But it's, it's interesting too, because it's like looking at that, looking at what they were doing back then, some of it is very odd, but then when you think about it, it's like, oh, it, it does make sense, you know, like it, it, would, it does add sense to make a little, to add a little bit of color here if you're older and you're trying yeah. to, you know, rejuvenate your face a little bit. Um, it's like highlighting. It's kind of like highlighting, yeah. So there's definitely been a few times when I've been reading stuff and been like, that's weird. And then like, oh, that actually makes sense. Okay. I think it's interesting too that this is cream blush, but it, it's actually working really nicely over the, over the pancake, which I really wasn't sure about, but I did practice it on myself to make sure that it would work and it does. I'm just blending this out just a little bit more. No hard lines. And something else they had was a little bit, tiny bit on the chin there. Okay. So final step is, of course, the lips. The lips, again, were not as codified, I'd say, as they were in the 20s. The 20s was all about making the, the lips quite a bit smaller. Um, you know, from the little tiny cupie doll that we kind of think the 20s is to the much just drawn inside the lips that it actually was. Um, so the lips in the 30s tended to be a little bit smaller, but I thought there were also pictures of, of stars and women, you know, with quite very similar to their natural lip line. So it's really just about kind of that 
kind of beautiful rosebud mouth, not too big. They definitely talk about in the books about not, make, not making your mouth too big. So um, yeah, so keeping it on the smaller side, but not going too far in the, in the costumey or overdrawn or underdrawn. Um, just kind of a pretty natural lip line. Lipstick colors in the 30s were a little more expanded than they were in the 20s. You had pinks, you had oranges, you had reds, red oranges, all those great things. I'm just gonna go ahead and use a beautiful red color. This is Forbidden Love by PMG Labs, Pat McGrath, who we love. And Sarah, again, has a beautiful 30s mouth. She has this beautiful natural curve to her upper lip, so I'm just gonna more or less follow that. Again, we're just going for the whole shebang, color everywhere. Yes. They, they do talk about using it out of the tube, putting lipstick on out of the tube or using a brush. I am gonna use a brush just because I do love the more control that it gives. Lip liner came into the scene in 1938. So if you're being authentic, you definitely could use lip liner. I'll give you a little more. I love a good Cupid's bow, I have to say. I think the 30s were a really fun time for cosmetics and for fashion too. And I think things got a lot more austere in the 40s. So I think the 30s was a time when there was a lot of experimentation happening with makeup and acceptance of makeup. So I think that's a really fun thing to keep in mind when you're when you're doing a 30s look on yourself. Would everyone have been wearing this whole look? Probably not, but I love the fact that there were, it was an option. You know, you could have, you could have done that back then. I think, I think the 30s mouth was just very curvaceous. Like I feel like all the no matter what the shape was, it was all about the curve of the upper lip line and very sexy. Like Jean Harlow with that, you know, almost impossible Cupid doll mouth. It's perfect. Yeah. It really was just a, a sexy time. I think, again, we think of the 30s as, you know, being very, still very black and white and not that, that you know, sexy, but that's, they had to, implement the, the code, you know, to, to make sure that things weren't too sexy on film and the, the dressing was so like super, super sexy. So it really was all about sex. Nice. And one last thing I want to do, we're almost done, but one of the really, really interesting things that I saw in the 1932 makeup book was they said if your eyes are wide set, to take a tiny, tiny dot of red rouge and put it on in the inner corner of your eye. So I just want to do that. Your eyes are actually perfectly symmetrical, but um, I just, that's a really fun thing that I want to try. It says to take red cream or paste rouge. So you're going to use that. And the tiniest little dot, it says to use an orange stick that you use on your cuticles, but we'll go ahead and use a little tiny, um, little tiny Q-tip here. Let's do both sides. This is one of those things I read and I was like, what? But it does, it does say like, only do this if you're, you know, going out at night or, you know, from going to be super far. Yeah, drama. <laughs> um, I like that that's something I read too quite a few times is, you know, like, don't do this in the daytime, only do this in the evening. Think about where you're going to be hanging out. Like one was like, you know, if you have a double chin, put, you know, blue or brown eyeshadow, you know, on your double chin to make it recede, which makes absolute sense. Yeah. But, you know, they say, you know, don't, don't do that if you're just going to be, hanging out with friends during the day. I'm like, oh, okay, well that's, you know, they, that's good. A darkly lit restaurant. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> a darkly lit candlelit restaurant, perfect. Daytime, no. So we're just gonna go in, we have our little tiny itty bitty bit of red, and then. This is actually an old theater trick, if you've ever seen photos of uh, dancers, uh, ballet dancers specifically from the from Swan Lake or something like that. They have a big, they put actually large red dots in the corner of the eyes and then you know overdraw everything else. So when I read that, I've never ever thought to do that in day makeup or outside of the theater, but it's a very cool trick. So I just wanted to try that. 
So one more step until we're done. I'm just gonna do one last little dusting of powder. They really loved their powder back then. And they do talk about you know, doing the, the blush and then doing the final bit of powder over it just to make it blend in. So this is our final 30s look. We have the beautiful high arched brows, fun eyeshadow color, long lashes, mascara top and bottom, high placed blush, and a beautiful curved sexy mouth. Thank you so much for joining us and thank you Sarah so much for being here. I really, really appreciate you doing this. Thanks for letting me do this. Yeah, you had, <laughs> the, perfect, you had the perfect 30s face and your hair is great and I just, I'm so happy we could do this. I had so much fun researching this and bringing this to you guys and doing this. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed doing it and please subscribe below if you haven't already and follow us on Instagram at myvintagelove blog for more regular updates and we'll see you at the next one. Bye. <laughs>